Reading Sign, Patrick F. McManus Back when I was a kid, the mark of a true woodsman was his ability to read sign. Knowing this, many persons trying to pass themselves off as woodsmen would make a great show of staring at sign for a few minutes and then offering up profound remarks about it. I judge from this broken twig that they're about ten minutes behind a herd of mule deer. Most of them yearlings or does, but there's one big fella I'd guess to be a trophy buck. You'll know him when you see him because he favors his left leg when he's running flat out and the only way to deal with a person like that was to walk over, look down, and say, For heaven's sake, so that's where I dropped my lucky twig. The amazing thing is, I broke it three months ago, and it still works. You then pick up the twig, put it in your pocket, and stroll away. My cousin Buck was one of these imposters. Even though I was several years younger than Buck, sign was serious business to me, and I spent long hours reading about it and studying it firsthand and trying to find out what it meant and whether it was a sign at all or maybe just an accident. Buck, on the other hand, couldn't concentrate on any subject longer than 15 seconds unless it wore a dress and smelled a perfume, which sign seldom, if ever, did. Still, ever so often, I had to endure his hauling me out to the woods to instruct me on in how to read sign. Hey, look here, he would hiss at me elk sign. Now any fool could see that the sign was not that of an elk, but the handiwork of a mule who had stood nearby with a smile on his face and a snicker in his voice. If I hadn't been smarter than I looked, I would have pointed the fact out to Buck. But not wishing to have my head thumped, I said, yes, elk, elk, I can see now where they, that they are elk. Thumping your head was Buck's way of proving to you that he could read sign. If I, on the other hand, happened to discover some fresh deer sign, Buck would always dismiss my find with a shrug of his shoulders and the profound bit of wisdom, you can't eat sign. He lived to regurgitate the, those words. One frosty November morn, Buck had dragged me out deer hunting with him. I wasn't old enough yet to carry a rifle, but Buck needed someone along to brag to about how he could read sign. We were cruising down a back road in Buck's old car, listening to Gene Autry on the radio and looking for deer. Buck believed the way to hunt deer was to drive up and down roads. That's, sort of a wo that's the sort of a woodsman he was. For breakfast, I had brought along some chocolate-covered peanuts in my jacket pocket, and ever so often I'd sneak one into my mouth so Buck wouldn't see it and demand a share. There was some fool notion in those days that if someone saw you with something good to eat, all you had to do was yell divvies at you and then you had to share with him. If you didn't share with somebody when he yelled divvies at you, he got to beat you up and take it all, but only if he was bigger than you were. If he was smaller, he could yell divvies till the sun went down you didn't have to share with him. In that way, I suppose it was equitable system, but I digress. So anyway, there we were driving down the back road, and all at once Buck hit the brakes and yelled out, Deer tracks! Sure enough, even from where I now sat wedged up against the dashboard, I could see that sometime during the past six months a deer had come sliding and bounding through the soft dirt of a high bank above the road. As soon as the car had slid to a stop, we jumped out. Buck, breathlessly thumbing cartridges into his rifle, and rushed over to examine the tracks. All the while, Buck was making sure he got full credit for spotting the tracks. I told you they were deer tracks, and you didn't believe me, did you? He whispered, his voice shrill with excitement. I believed you, Buck. Well, we must have been driving fa past 50 miles an hour, and I looks out and I says to you, There's some deer tracks. Now, didn't I say that? That's what you said, Buck. We looked at the tracks, Buck got down on his knees and felt the edges of the tracks, apparently to see if they were still warm. Then he bent over and sniffed them. It was almost too much to bear for a serious student of deer tracks. Any fool could see those tracks were so old they could have been classified as fossils. The deer who made them, no doubt, had since known a long and happy life and finally expired at a ripe old age. They fresh, Buck? I asked. 
Buck stood up and tugged at his wispy beard as he studied the tracks. I'd say he went through here, oh, about a half hour before daylight. Gee, I said, stifling a yawn. We must just missed him. Mm, dang, if we'd been here a few minutes earlier, huh, Buck? Yep, Buck said. Well, win some, lose some. While I was racking my brain trying to think of some that Buck had won, a terrible idea occurred to me, and the instant the idea occurred, I implemented it. Even after thirty years and more, I'm still ashamed of pulling it on Buck, but I'm still convulsed with that I'm still convulsed with laugh, laughter upon recalling the expression on his face is even more despicable. Only the desire to ease my conscience, con conscience compels me to confess the deed. What I did, oh, I shudder still to think of it, was to take a handful of chocolate-covered peanuts and sprinkle them on the ground by my feet. Hey, Buck, I said, pointing. Sign, looks fresh, too. Buck looked at me in disgust and shook his shaggy head. How many times I gotta tell you, you can't eat sign. At that, I reached down, picked up a chocolate-covered peanut, snapped it into the air, and caught it in my mouth. Buck's jaw dropped halfway to his belt buckle. For years afterward, Buck couldn't stand the sight of chocolate-covered peanuts. Offer him one, his upper lip would flutter like a broken window shade. Sure, when old Buck figured out the trick I'd played on him, he'd thump my head until both of us were worn out. But that didn't change the obvious truth. He just wasn't a proper woodsman. Much of my early knowledge about sign was gained from reading books and magazine articles. These usually included drawings of the tracks of various wild animals, and all you had to do was memorize the shape and the number of toes and so on to be able to identify the track out in the wilds. I spent endless hours at this sort of study, but it was well worth the effort. For one thing, it taught me about true friendship. If you were out with one of your friends in the woods, you could point to a set of tracks and say, Look, Lynx tracks. Gee, the friend would say in a properly appreciative tone. If he didn't say that or have an equivalent expression, he wasn't your friend. Now, if you followed the lynx tracks and at the other end of them found a skunk waddling along, you would say to your friend, studying him closely, sometimes skunks make lynx tracks. Did you know that? No, I didn't, he might reply. That really is interesting. Such a reply could mean only two things. The guy was impossibly stupid, or he was a really good friend. Strangely enough, many of the magazine articles on sign were written by a lady. Her underlining principle was that wild animals were actors on the stage of the great outdoors. If you could read the scripts, namely their tracks in the snow, you could decipher the plot. A typical plot would go like this. Rabbit tracks are crossing the snow from one direction and coyote tracks from another. The two sets of tracks intersect at the base of a tree. Only the coyote tracks continue on from the tree. Hmm. How did the rabbit get away from the tree without making any tracks? Did he climb the tree? The mystery was almost mind-boggling. The author of these articles could take an hour's walk through the snow and encounter a dozenating fascinating little dramas, none of which, I might add, were ever comedies. I hate to admit it, but at a certain age, I was intrigued by these articles and was forever searching the snowy countryside for evidence of little wildlife dramas. Unfortunately, most of the dramas I encountered went about like this. Rabbit tracks emerge from thicket, go under barbed wire fence, mess around in a patch of blackberry brambles, cross a creek over thin ice, go under another barbed wire fence, mossy, oh, moss, oh, mosey back across the thin ice, meander through the blackberry brambles again, pass under another barbed wire fence, and go into the thicket. That would be it. Although drama itself might be deadly dull, following the script around the country could be fraught with pain and danger and excitement. Several times I nearly froze to death in my wet clothes while rushing home to bandage my scratches and cuts and to dig out the stickers. <laughs> where I really learned to read sign, oh, where I really learned to read sign was from the old woodsman Rancid Crabtree. Rancid didn't care a hoot about reading little woodland dramas.
To him, sign was not a form of entertainment, but an essential element in a complex scheme that he had devised to make working for a living unnecessary. About the only thing Rancid needed money for were a few clothes, rifle and shotgun, shells, salt and pepper, some gas for his old truck, chewing tobacco, and his medicine, which a local pharmacist, which a local pharmacist, a Colt 45, stuffed in the waistband of his pants, delivered at night in court-sized mason jars. These commodities required cash, particularly the medicine. Rance had acquired his cash by running a little trap line each winter, and successful trapping required a rather extensive knowledge of sign. The intensity and seriousness of which Rance had studied sign can be fully appreciated only by realizing that to him it was virtually the same thing as tobacco and medicine. To Rancid, sign was a matter of ultimate concern. A stroll with Rancid through the woods was a course in postgraduate study in reading sign. Bar, he would say, pointing to the ground as he walked along. Porcupine, bobcat, skunk, and so on. One day we were going along in this fashion, he pointed down and said, Snake. Snake, I said to myself, glancing down. This is new. Snake? My bare foot was descending toward the fat, frantic reptile. Despite my precarious posture, I managed to execute a successful liftoff before coming into contact, coming into actual contact with the creature. While involved in this effort, I left. I let my vocal cords unattended, and they took advantage of their moment of freedom to get off a loud and startling shriek. Upon hearing this, Rancid leaped to the conclusion that he had misjudged the snake as being a member of a benevolent sect and immediately began to curse and hop about and flail the earth with his walking stick. <laughs> he was all pretty excited and Rancid was more than a little annoyed when he found out the snake hadn't taken a bite out of me after all. Gold dang, he said, don't never scream like that, aging for no reason. Let let the thing at least get a taste of you for your starts hollering like you've been bit. Now tarn loose my hair and neck and get down off of my shoulders. Over the years, my wife has become quite an expert on reading sign, ferreting out clues here and there and matching up odd bits of trivial information from which to deduce an ingenious conclusion that couldn't make the slightest difference to anyone. I like to call her... The the Sherlock Holmes of Sign. Just recently she came in and reported that the reason the grass in an orchard up on the hill was matted down was that a herd of elk had been sleeping there. Ha! I said. Probably just cows. What makes you think it's elk? Elementary, my dear Watson, she said. Elementary. There are, of course, worse things than a smart aleck woman. A, few, a fellow even told me that they were one, uh, excuse me, a fellow even told me what they were once, but I cannot even remember. Campgrounds are my wife's favorite places for sleuthing. As soon as we arrive at a campsite, she's out of the car in a flash, reading the sign. Party of four camped here last night. Spent at least three days, I'd say, from the amount of ash in the fireplace. At least one of them was a slob. How do you know that? Threw the pool tabs from his beer cans all over the place. Boy, that's really disgusting. You'd think he'd care what kind of example he was setting for his kids. His kids? Yeah, there were three wiener sticks leaning against the tree over there. You can see the remains of toasted coconut-covered marshmallows on two of the sticks. Only kids can eat burnt toasted coconut-covered marshmallows and live. Boy, if I were married to that lazy slob, she said, holding up the third wiener stick. Look. The wife's stick has a fork on the end of it. That's so she could cook a wiener for the old man while she was doing her own. Well, I never... The guy sounds like a real slob, no doubt about it, I said. Hey, don't throw that fork wiener stick away. You never know when something like that might come in handy. One good thing about fork wiener sticks, it's difficult to run a person through with them. <laughs> I myself don't have much opportunity to read sign anymore. To tell the truth, my reading tastes have changed a good deal over the last years and I've just as soon curl up with a good book or magazine. Also, books and magazines are nicer to keep around the house and you're much less likely to 
to get dirty looks if you read them in public waiting rooms.